the great solace we all take after watching a scary movie is that no matter how invested or engaged we might be, once it's over, we return to our normal lives, safe in the assurance that it is a work of fiction. However, sometimes reality can be equally, if not more terrifying than any film. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two vintage murder cases more disturbing than horror movies. But first, I'd like to thank Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's episode. It's a scene we're all familiar with. The air is crisp, the leaves are changing, and lighting an autumnal fire in the chimney for a night of at-home movies sounds perfect. However, there is one problem. You've binged all the true crime series and paranormal documentaries on the big streaming services. So what now? Where do you go to get your mystery fix? Don't you want something better than just another made-for-TV crime thriller? Well, what about an interactive murder mystery subscription-based game delivered right to your doorstep that transports you to a crime scene and makes you the private eye? Hunter Killer brings to life your favorite true crime procedurals and makes you the main character, assisting you with a box complete with detailed clues, ciphers, and codes to solve during your sleuthing adventures. Whether you want to investigate solo or with a team of detectives, no autumn night is complete without a real-life clue keeping you and your friends on guard as you search for the killer. Even if your friends are in another time zone, Hop on Zoom or Skype and investigate your case using the documents provided in each box. Full of character dossiers, brilliantly written backgrounds, and narratives of a quality not seen in other true crime projects. The best part of it all is for the price of a sit-down meal or a trip to the cinema, you can relax, stay at home, and have the detective experience you've always dreamed of. We at Cold Case Detective also want to highlight the community Hunter Killer builds outside of just sending boxes to doorsteps. Hundreds of thousands of fans have come together to form an enthusiastic online community to discuss the hardest of cases you couldn't solve alone, and just to hang out and chat about all things mystery. To join the Crime Chasing Collective, our viewers can go to hunterkiller.com forward slash coldcasedetective and use the code coldcasedetective for $10 off your first purchase and to support our channel. So toss aside the TV remote, grab your magnifying glass, and join us to hunt a killer. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Chrissy Venn. Chrissy Venn was a 13-year-old living in Tasmania, Australia, when she went missing after leaving her family home on Allison Road. At 5 p.m. on Saturday, February 26, 1921, Chrissy headed out. Her house was surrounded by farmland and forest, and was located around three miles from North Modern. A short time later, two boys, who were the sons of a prominent local farmer and landowner named John Herps, heard a single, high-pitched scream from the nearby woods as they worked on their father's fields. However, they decided not to investigate the noise. When Chrissy didn't return home by 7 o'clock that evening, her mother, Eva, set out along Allison Road to look for her missing daughter. However, she could find no sign of the 13-year-old. By the following morning, dozens of members of the local community came to assist in the search, although the search groups left empty-handed each night. At 11.30 a.m. on Tuesday, March 1st, a group of locals were searching a deep ravine about half a mile from Chrissy's home. It was adjacent to the field where John Herps' sons were working on the day of the teenager's disappearance. As the area was filled with large tree stumps, locals began investigating them as they passed. One charred stump in particular, about 9 foot high with a 16 inch wide hollow in the center, was examined and revealed the body of Chrissy Venn. She had been stuffed headfirst inside the stump. Beneath Chrissy's body lay the basket she had left home with that day, along with her handkerchief, a bottle which had originally been inside the basket, a cap, and her underwear. Money which had been given to her by her mother the day she disappeared was missing. 
Twisted around the teenager's neck was a piece of hay baling wire, about one foot in length. Part of her dress had been torn off and stuffed down her throat. The medical examiner determined that Chrissy had died due to suffocation and noted that it appeared she had been sexually assaulted as semen was found inside her body. It was clear that the 13-year-old had fought ferociously, both from the evidence on her body and that which was available at the crime scene, which was established as being 12 yards from the tree stump. Here, investigators collected a mound of evidence, including safety pins, a piece of wire, a blood-stained stick, and pieces of cotton fabric that had blood on them. The fabric was likely used as a sanitary pad. It was quickly discovered that the pieces of wire found at the scene had been cut from a nearby gate leading on to John Herps's fields, and before long, police had pinned down their prime suspect, a local farm worker named George William King. King was a 36-year-old man who was married with children and was familiar with Chrissy and her mother, as he spent time at the pair's house on several occasions, staying late into the night. While King had assisted in the search for the 13-year-old, he was not with the party who found her body. However, several people noticed the deep wounds and scratches on his hands, which police found to be suspicious. One particularly nasty cut was festering. According to several local witnesses, Chrissy had been afraid of King and had recently started to run and hide from him if she saw him coming, concealing herself in the brush. King, for his part, told authorities he had no idea why the teenager would do such a thing. However, police only grew more weary of him the more they spoke with him, as the 36-year-old changed the details of his alibi on several different occasions. An inquest into Chrissy's demise found that she was willfully murdered by some person or persons unknown. The jury added, We are of the opinion that the weight of evidence is sufficiently strong against the accused, George William King, to warrant his committal for trial. King's trial began on August 14th and concluded one week later when he was found not guilty and acquitted of all charges. Afterwards, the lead detective on Chrissy's case was fired for incompetence, as he'd reportedly failed to interview other persons of interest, focusing only on the farm worker. The coroner also suffered following the end of the trial. He had failed to collect and preserve key pieces of evidence between Chrissy's death in February and the trial in August, and had changed his findings so many times that his testimony became unreliable. According to the examiner, in March of 1921, King had received an anonymous, unsigned letter that was crudely written with an equally crude representation of a man hanging by the neck from the gallows. The letter read, Take care. I saw you murder Chrissy Venn, and if you don't confess, I'm going to tell the police. Despite the efforts of law enforcement, the letter writer was never identified. After King's acquittal, Chrissy's case grew cold. In recent years, online sleuths have found newspaper clippings showing that Chrissy was raped in 1917, when she was just 10 years old. Frustratingly, the culprit was acquitted of all charges, and once again, there was no justice for the young girl. Chrissy's family life appeared to be rather a strange one. Her mother, born Eva May Chilcutt, married Chrissy's father, George Arthur Venn, in 1906. Reportedly, Eva was 24 and George was 18. The couple had Chrissy in 1907 and a son one year later, although it's unclear what became of him, as there are almost no mentions of him in articles about Chrissy's case. Eva later claimed that George had drowned at sea, but gave varying accounts of the exact circumstances of his death, once even claiming that he died in 1902, which would have made him 13 and would have made it very difficult for them to have married four years later and had children. One researcher found that George was actually alive as late as 1917 and suspects that the couple never actually lived together. A man of the same name lived in Somerset in Queensland during the years Eva was married. Stranger still, two days before Chrissy's murder, a woman named Edith Revel, who was married to George Venn's cousin, took her own life. She was found drowned in East Ulverstone Beach on February 24th. Her handbag was also found, and inside it contained a letter addressed to farmer and landowner John Herps. A segment of the letter said, Don't go to Jim. He's in trouble. Do what you can to comfort him. I must go. Additionally, Edith wrote in a separate note that she, quote, made my will 
and left it with Mrs. Chilcott. It is unclear if Mrs. Chilcott was Chrissy's mother, who would have gone by Mrs. Dawes at the time, but it was certainly an odd coincidence, if nothing else. It is also interesting that Edith and her husband James Venn had a connection with John Herps. It is unknown what sort of trouble James Venn was in at the time Edith wrote her letter, and it is unclear why Edith took her own life. No other suspects were ever identified in Chrissy's case. Today, there is some speculation that her case may be linked with that of another murdered girl, Alma Turchk, who was strangled to death in Melbourne in December of 1921. While a man was convicted and hanged for Alma's demise, forensics later cleared him and he was pardoned in 2008. Both Chrissy and Alma's cases remain unsolved. Elsie Siegel. 20 year old Elsie Siegel, whose grandfather was a famous military general named Franz Siegel, grew up living a rather privileged life. From a wealthy, upper class background, her mother taught a Chinese Sunday school class in St. Andrew's Church at 127th Street and 5th Avenue in New York City. Although it went against her father's wishes, Elsie's mother soon began taking her to Chinatown with her, where the pair worked as missionaries reaching out in particular to girls involved with drugs and sex work. It was here that mother and daughter met a Chinese immigrant named Leon Ling, who sometimes went by William, and who was reportedly well-educated and spoke excellent English. He was described, along with his roommate, a man named Chon Sing, as Americanized and Christianized. While Ling initially began meeting with Elsie and her mother for lunch and shopping trips, eventually Ling and Elsie began to bond, and the young woman began sneaking out to see him on her own. Elsie was last seen alive, leaving her parents' home on Wadsworth Avenue on June 9th, 1909. Three days later, her father received a telegram from Washington, D.C., which read, I'll be home by the end of the week. Don't worry, Elsie. A week later, on June 19th, the local police department were contacted by the owner of a Chinese restaurant, who told him that he was concerned about his cousin, who lived above his business on the top floor of the apartment block. The man explained that he hadn't seen his cousin, Leon Ling, in six days, and that his apartment door was locked, and he received no response from him when he knocked or called out. As a result of this phone call, a police officer was dispatched to perform a welfare check. Inside, the officer found the flat to be empty, except for a bed and a lone trunk, bound with rope and ready to be shipped. Inside the trunk, was the body of a young woman. She was naked, but wrapped in a bedsheet and had been dead for at least one week. Wrapped around her neck was a cord not unlike the kind used on the blinds of a window. Outside of this, the woman's body bore no marks of violence. Also around her neck was a thin gold chain with a bangle attached to it. The jewelry piece was inscribed with the letters ECS. Additionally, another bracelet was found in the room inscribed with the letters E-L-S. It was then that Ling's cousin pointed out that his sweetheart was Elsie Siegel, and that he'd seen the couple at the theater together. The homicide unit was contacted about the body, and investigators quickly got to work. Nobody had seen Ling or his roommate Chon Sing, and the authorities felt that they were in some way involved with the murdered girl, since they'd vanished at the same time. Upon speaking with the Siegel family, investigators were told that Elsie was not, in fact, missing, her family then said that she was out of town. It's possible law enforcement were told this so the family could avoid a scandal. The family of American socialite Dorothy Arnold did the same thing when she vanished in 1910. Mr. Siegel was taken to view his daughter's body, as well as the jewelry found with her. However, he was unable to identify with the bracelets or his daughter. Mrs. Siegel was then shown both and was able to positively identify them. Now armed with the identity of their victim, the police placed images of both Ling and Chong Sing in local and national newspapers. On June 20th, police were contacted by a man who'd hired a new cook for his establishment. He claimed that his new employee strongly resembled Sing's image. Sing was apparently going by the name Ah Sing. Shortly after this phone call, police found Sing and brought him into custody, where he admitted his true identity, but denied being involved with Elsie's death. Meanwhile, Investigators continued to gather more background on Ling and his relationship with Elsie. They found out that prior to the 20-year-old's disappearance, Ling had spent some time living in the home she shared with her family. 
On June 1st, he called the police and explained that he had loaned Elsie $300, but there had been a misunderstanding about the repayment of the debt. However, he still had possessions at her family's home and requested that an officer accompany him so that no one would make a scene or think he was attempting to stir up trouble. An officer accompanied Ling to the property, where he collected his things without incident. Shortly after Elsie's body was identified, her father came forward, revealing that both Ling and a man named Chu Gain, who was the manager of the Port Arthur restaurant on Mott Street, were in love with his daughter. According to Mr. Siegel, on the evening of June 8th, the family had held a party which both men attended. Apparently, Ling had turned up drunk, and he had pulled Elsie aside and told her that if she had anything to do with Gain, he would kill them both. Further corroborating this story, Gain admitted to police that he had been threatened by Ling. He then told authorities how, on June 9th, Singh had come to him and said that if Gain provided Ling with enough money to fund his travel expenses, he would leave the city forever. Gain was over the moon, as he obviously did not enjoy living with a death threat hanging over his head. He gave Singh all that he had, $260, after which Singh left, although he reportedly seemed agitated. After this confession, Gain was arrested pending further investigation, but was later released. Additionally, investigators uncovered a letter addressed to him in his room. It was from Elsie and was dated June 8th. It read as followed. It read as follows. My dear friend, I don't want you to feel badly because Willie was here tonight. You know that I love you and you only and always will. Don't mind Willie. Although he is nothing to me now, I had to see him last night. I did not send for him. Your ever-loving, Elsie. Meanwhile, in Ling's room, authorities found a letter from the 20-year-old, although the date of it is unclear. In the notes, Elsie mentioned that she was writing the letter while her mother was not home, as she would not let her write to him. She went on to say, quote, Don't think, Willie, that I will ever give you up. I will always remember the good times we have together. Please let me know if I can see you soon and how. With love, Elsie. Eventually, what is generally accepted as the truth came to light when Chong Sing finally decided to open up to the police. According to Sing, at 10.30 on the morning of June 9th, Elsie came to the apartment to see Ling and chastise him for his poor conduct at the party the previous night and to tell him not to call her house anymore. Sing initially stayed downstairs while Elsie went up to see Ling, but eventually he too went upstairs where he heard a noise in one of the rooms. Peeking through a partially opened door, he saw the couple struggling with one another. He told authorities, I saw blood on her face and I saw a handkerchief up to her mouth. He said that Ling then threw Elsie's motionless body onto the bed before he ripped off her clothing and wrapped her up in a sheet. Afterwards, he pulled the trunk from a cupboard. Seeing this, Singh commented to his flatmates that the whole incident was dirty work and that he was going away. Although it's not clear why, Singh gave Ling $200 of his own money and the $260 he extorted from Gain before leaving and moving in with his cousin. Following this confession, Singh was held as a material witness under a $10,000 bail. Around this time, investigators uncovered that it was Ling who had sent the telegram from Washington DC to Elsie's father. They also found out that after the murder, Ling had spent some time trying to dispose of the trunk, passing it around to various businesses owned by Chinese friends and acquaintances. He reportedly wanted to leave it indefinitely at a specific restaurant, but the owner refused. So Ling had to return to the apartment with the trunk, where it was later discovered by police. Detectives theorized that Elsie's clothing was burned using the apartment's stove. Eventually, Chong Sing was released due to there being insufficient evidence to hold him. Newspapers in both the US and Canada published photos of Ling for months following the discovery of Elsie's body. In fact, her case stayed in the headlines for over two years. But despite law enforcement's intense search for him, Ling has never been located. Several news articles report that in 1910, the Secret Service found that Ling had made his way to Canada and then back to China, where he lived out the rest of his life on a farm. For many people, Elsie's murder is cut and dry. Others, however, have various theories about what really happened. Some online sleuths have speculated that the couple ran away to Washington originally, 
but that Ling killed Elsie and returned her body to New York. Others have wondered if her death was staged and the body in the trunk was a look-alike. It's also been suggested that the 20-year-old killed herself in Ling's apartment, leaving him to clear up the scene, or that Singh's story is untrue, that he was involved in the crime, but he made the whole thing up to get himself off the hook. Because the case involved a young, upper-class white woman who was having an affair with an immigrant, it caused quite a stir among the public and newspapers. The fact that it was the famous Siegel family who were at the center of the incident only added more fuel to the flames. The state of New York and beyond saw much anti-Chinese rhetoric in the years following Elsie's demise, and there was also a lot of gossip about her murder was her own fault for behaving improperly at the time. Although it is unclear just what became of Ling, the fact that he was never apprehended remains. Elsie's family never saw justice, and her case remains unsolved. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.